Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about the fraud case with Trump that's going on right now. So I think he's on the hook for like $464 million. Uh, that's insane. I mean, I, I, as an average American, I can't, I can't even fathom owing someone that much money, owing a government that much money. But in, in essence, what the, the essence of the case is, is that, and I haven't looked at every detail, but the, the core of it is that Trump overvalued properties and what that means is it's financial fraud and so the overvaluation of those properties effectively is it's it's again it's tax fraud but beyond that what i really want to talk about is kind of the downstream effects of tax fraud because this is what a lot of people don't understand i don't think about inflation because in reality, okay, what happens when someone like Trump overvalues properties? What's really happening is he's causing inflation. Now, this may not make sense to you if you don't understand how economies work, but let's let's think about this. So, Trump takes his properties and say say in a, in a fair free market they're worth. Eh, I don't know, this is an example. Say say they're worth. 200 million dollars but he values them at 434 million dollars i don't know what the actual details are it's just an example so he's overvalued these properties by over 100 percent, right and what this does though is let's say he wants to sell one of those properties let's say he wants to sell it to some other millionaire billionaire person right and that that millionaire has to buy that property now because trump has overvalued that property by over 100 percent, that millionaire has to come up with that 100%, right? He has to come up with that extra $264 million or whatever that I gave in this example. So what does that millionaire do who buys Trump's property? Well, that millionaire, well, he's a millionaire, right? The person buying Trump's property. So he owns stock in hundreds of other companies, probably. He owns perhaps companies in the entirety, private companies, perhaps. So that owner uses the power he has the stock in the owning of that stock in those other companies and he raises the prices in those markets because how else is he going to afford to purchase the company from trump right so so what does that cause well that means that all of the prices in the companies that the person buying trump's company or trump's property all of the prices in those markets they're going to go up right and what does that lead to well eventually what you have is this inflation the, this this these overinflated uh property values that trump started that trump originally overvalued they trickle all the way down to your average small business owner now your average small business owner is paying uh, over a hundred percent more than they need to for what for the the raw materials that drive their business and before long, you basically have so much fraud at the top that every small business in the country can't pay their employees enough to work, right? And before long, again, you have 60% of people living paycheck to paycheck. So this is a huge, a huge contributor to inflation. You know, a, a lot of financial experts, financial gurus will say, will we'll blame the inflation on the printing of money, right? And that's a valid argument, okay? When you print money, it does cause inflation. However, if you print money, if you have a stimulus bill that is that does not attach or does not uh, that where that money is not attached to new value creation, the money the the prices the inflation can only inflate in so far as that new uh, money allows, right? So if you detect an overcorrection in inflation, then what that actually insinuates is that there's corruption in the market what that insinuates is that the owners are seeing that's in this stimulus bill they're seeing this new money that's being printed and they're taking advantage of it they're taking advantage of it by raising by overcorrecting the prices and what that does is it moves more wealth upward right and that's what we saw with covid okay so if we look at the two covid stimulus bills that came out of both the biden and the trump administration the result was an overcorrection in inflation, okay, from both of them, from both those administrations, both the Democrat and Republican administrations. What that, again, what that insinuates is that the market, this supposedly free market 
the capitalistic market has caught on to these stimulus bills. They're seeing the stimulus bills and then they're taking advantage of those stimulus bills. Okay, they're going to overcorrect the prices. They're going to steal more wealth from the lower class and the working class. And then what happens? Well, they get wealthier. And that's what we've seen. We have seen a greater transfer of wealth to the top 1% than we have ever seen before since these since COVID, right? In response to these stimulus bills. So again, what's happening is the market is so organized at the top that they are overcorrecting prices in response to this inflation. So it's all fraud. Okay, that means any company who has overcorrected a price is committing fraud, just like Trump. Okay, just like the over, just like the overvaluation of property. It's like just because Trump's overvaluing property, but the overvaluation of property again it trickles down through all property, including products and services. Right, anything sold in the economy, this fraud is going to trickle down through because every time. A millionaire wants to purchase another property from another millionaire, as I gave with that Trump example. They have to overvalue their assets now in order to keep up with the the previously overvalued assets by Trump, right? For example, now this this did not begin with Trump. I'm not saying Trump is the original over is it the original person who overvalued properties. That's not where this began, in any way. It began long before he was born. Okay, so I don't want you to get the the idea that he is the cause. He's just a symptom. Trump is just a symptom. Now, let's look at a, another argument someone might say is that Trump didn't value the properties. The bank valued properties. So there's some bank that valued the properties, right? And they overvalued the properties. So it's actually the bank's fault. Well, yes, that's that, that's true. The bank also committed fraud. Okay, it's not just. Be, and, and here's the thing: when you go to value your property. You're going to get several valuations, right, from from different sources, and you're going to pick the highest valuation logically, right? That's what you want to do if you want to make yourself wealthier, in effect, right? So, what Trump's going to do is he's going to go to a bunch of different banks and get a bunch of different property valuations, and he's going to pick the highest one, and that's probably what he did. That's probably what every billionaire who owns property does, and we can blame the banks. So that's fair enough. But the problem here is, again, is the banks are committing fraud as well. Okay, it, when they when they give a bullshit evaluation of a property, or a bullshit valuation of property, that they, they're committing fraud. And the thing is, again, the banks are just more billionaires. Okay, the, the the people who own the banks, the people who give these valuations out, they are just as corrupt as any other large corporation. Who is inflating prices in order to to basically make up for their losses? So again, in the original example where some millionaire purchases one of Trump's properties, that millionaire can then use go to another fraudulent bank and have their property that they purchased from Trump overvalued, and and then they can they can control the markets. They can raise the prices in order to make up for their losses that Trump. Passed on to them, right? So Trump overvalues his values his property. He sells it. Well, now the person who bought his property has to overvalue the assets they own, whether it's the whether it's up another property, for example, or whether it's a stock. And how do you overvalue a stock? Well, you, you raise the prices in the in the market, right? So if you own stock in Apple, you're going to raise the cost of an iPhone, and because in all likelihood, the people buying Trump's properties, in all likelihood, they're involved with BlackRock and Vanguard and all of these investment banks. What do they do? Well, again, those BlackRock and Vanguard, those investment banks, they puppeteer these companies because they own so much stock in these companies. They puppeteer them. Okay, they 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 control their their daily operations, and that means that the price is by in effect, right? This is how fraud works. Fraud isn't this. The thing about this is, you see a lot of millionaires on these financial shows freaking out about Trump's this this Trump fraud case. It's because if the highest man, if, if a former president can be convicted for this, it means anyone can be convicted for it, and and that's what they don't want you to know. That's why they're freaking out about it. That's why they're trying to distract. And I'm going to leave you a clip in the description about one example of this. One example of another multi-millionaire who is freaking out and, and distracting away from the real core of the issue. 
core of the issue is that the fraud is what's actually causing the majority of the inflation in the country. <clears throat> and they always want to point to some other cause. They want to point to a stimulus bill. They want to point to illegal immigrants. They want to point to culture wars. They'll point to anything to distract you from the fact that the people who set the prices are actually the people who control the inflation. And again, because it's such, this has been going on for so long, the actual source, the original source of this, this fraud is, is not really identifiable. You can't track it down and, and there's, it's impossible to. The source is greed, right? The source is that people want more money for themselves and because they want more money for themselves, they, they're going to look for that bank that values their property the highest and by extension, they're going to inflate the prices in response to stimulus bills. Again, the whole market is getting away with this. And Trump is just <clears throat> one man who's getting caught. And he's he's a man with a big name, right? He's Again, he's a former president. If the former president can be punished for this, anyone can be punished for it. And that's what, <laughs> that's what the ruling class doesn't want you to, to catch on to. So we have to... As the as of the working class, as a member of the working class, how do you fight this? How do you contribute? Or how do you fix this problem? It's quite simple. Okay, again, we look at BlackRock and Vanguard. They might own eight percent of Apple and Google and Face and Facebook and etc. They might own eight percent of these companies, but in reality, the bulk of the stock, the bulk of the the capital of these large corporations is not, is not owned by BlackRock. It's not owned by billionaires. It's owned by perhaps wealthy middle class to poor uh, middle, uh, to the middle middle class, right? It's owned by anyone who can afford stock all the way on up to millionaires, right? But the bulk of it, over 50%, well over 50% is owned by everyday Americans in your 401ks, in your IRAs, right? When you invest in the S&P 500, you are making an investment in a company. And that company currently is being puppeteered by BlackRock, by Vanguard, by billionaires, right? If the working class organizes and leverages their well over 50% ownership together, they start to be, they, they flip the script. They become the ones who are directing the everyday operations of these corporations. And what that means is the prices stop going up, the inflation stop going up, stops going up, the wages start going up, right? Because instead of being puppeteered by the billionaires, who in order to, <laughs> in order to keep, remain a billionaire, they, so they stagnate the wages and raise the prices. Instead of that happening, again, the middle class leverages their power. They leverage the percent ownerships that they have, and the way they do that, there's a number of ways. Okay. One way could be through uh, uh, through elections, right? If we elect the right president, not only maybe that president in a single term can't can't pass all of the necessary economic policies to make this happen, but they can start a movement. They can start a social movement that brings the working class together across cultural divides, and that's the main problem. I, I, I speak of culture wars a lot. The main problem is that the working class, who owns the media. Who owns the media? The billionaires, BlackRock, Vanguard. They're the ones, again, that control the everyday operations of these media corporations. Those media corporations that fill your daily news feed, they want to divide you. And they divide you by distracting you with culture wars. And then you vote. You prioritize those, those culture wars in the voting booth. And before long, again, the economic policies of the Democrat and Republican Party, they become eerily similar. Okay? And that's what we have to catch on to. They become eerily similar, and they debate about abortion, religion, gun rights. You get it. They, race, race relations, right? They debate about all that stuff, and their economic policy become, merges in effect. And again, that's what we saw with COVID. In response to these stimulus bills, <coughs> we have basically a bunch of, uh, of large corporations, and the people puppeteering those corporations, the operations of those corporations, they're inflating the prices. And when they inflate the prices trickles all the way down to your average consumer and now we're 60 percent of us are living paycheck to paycheck again so again what we have to do is organize that the one way was is through 
a movement created through a leader. And we could talk about who that the best person to vote for is, but I'm not going to give you any voting advice. That's not my job. Another option is unionize, okay? Labor organization in general. And what that does is it forces these corporations to basically hand you the value to your, the, hand you your value creation to, to give you the value you've created rather than taking it for themselves, rather than distributing that value out to capital investors who <laughs> who are basically stealing the value creation of the everyday working men. So those are your two options. The difference between those two options, the difference between the government solution and the free market solution, okay, the, the economic policy and the the union the, the union solution is the difference between communism and capitalism by the way so what that means is that either we can become a more communistic nation and we can we can uh, choose to elect politicians who will write economic policies that will direct all this from the top down or we can choose the free market solution which is to create these unions create these labor movements labor strikes perhaps or worker co-ops and what that does is it's the free market solution again it is the capitalistic solution now if you have a capitalistic market who has become who has basically merged with the government uh, a corporate government merger of sorts if you have this if you have that body dictating what unions can do if they if you have them restricting union unions what you basically have is the end of free market capitalism unions are part of a free market capitalist economy they are the solution for the working class to take back their value creation to stop the exploitation of labor if you restrict the organization of unions you're no longer a free market capitalist economy and you know there's i look at elon musk and and there's a lot of good things elon musk has done with twitter i i particularly like the anti-censorship things he's pushing now it's not strictly anti-censorship you talk about that but i'm not getting into details there right now he is also kind of pushing against unions a little bit and i don't like that because that's not free market capitalism free market capitalism encourages unions and encourages unions because in the long term those unions are good for the sustainability the stability of the free market capitalistic economy in the short term though <laughs> those unions are bad for profits they're good for long-term stability, though. And that's what a lot of capitalists may may or may not understand. A lot of those billionaires, they may not believe that those unions are good for stability long-term. But they are. Because if you don't allow those unions, if you union bust, you basically force so much poverty down onto the working class that they revolt, right? And that's what's bad for long-term stability. Again, even if it is good for their short-term profits, even if they do die with with a, a billion plus dollars in their bank account it doesn't actually create a world that works for their children or their grandchildren so again the, the the best thing to to take away from this video is that inflation you know if someone's telling you that inflation is caused by printing money they're right but an overcorrection of inflation that leeches money from the working class up into the wealthier class that insinuates an overcorrection in inflation again that insinuates financial fraud that insinuates that somebody is puppeteering the economy because they can and if the working class does not organize to fix this problem they're going to end up ripping each other's throats apart and <laughs> anyone's throat's fair game when that starts okay I I including the billionaires that's that's again that's the the foresight that i feel like a lot of billionaires lack they don't see the end of the road here it's like we are we're kind of replaying the fall of rome in slow motion and if we catch on to it if we learn from history we can stop it and we can become a, a, a much more resilient nation economy and, and and global force in general as as humanity rather than just one nation because the the thing that we have on the thing the advantage we have over ancient rome is we have more technology and that technology enables us to look at the grander scale of things it encourages us to it, it enables us it demands us rather to look at the way that our economies intermingle with each other to look at the globalization that's playing out on a grander scale 
So again, if Trump, just to go over this one more time, if Trump raises his prices, of, overvalues his properties, and some billionaire buys that property, that billionaire has to now overvalue the prices of his properties, his or her properties. And then that trickles all the way down. Each, it's, it's a cycle that goes all the way through the economy until every owner who purchases something from another owner is basically buying overvalued property. That is inflation. Okay, so again, this, is, this didn't begin with Trump. Trump overvalued the properties because he found a corrupt bank that would do it for him. And that corrupt bank has got away with it for so long that well, they do it, right? The point here is that the entire system is corrupted by greed. And we have to really think about why people are greedy. Because if we think it's just because people are just want to be greedy, if we think they're just sinister people, if we assume that everyone who is a billionaire is just a sinister person, we're, we're going to start a revolution. And that's not a violent revolution. That's not what we want. What we want is... <laughs> what we want is to encourage a little empathy here we need a little empathy for the billionaires and i know that might be hard to, to choke down but the point here is that people are greedy because they're fearful most billionaires are greedy because they're fearful there may be a few a few sinister billionaires but most people most billionaires are greedy because they fear poverty and therefore they 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 basically make it their life goal to to insulate themselves from that poverty with insane amounts of excess wealth. And what that means is that we're, we're basically going to continue to see this model of an economy, this where the wealth get wealthier and the, and the poor get poorer until we empathize across, uh, across class divides, until the billionaires have empathy for the, the poor people living on the street and vice versa because otherwise the billionaires are going to leverage their power to further push the, the, the working class down to further insulate themselves from that poverty and again that insulation will not work for very long because it, where are the wealthiest billionaires they're, they're in a gated community behind a deadbolt okay that doesn't that doesn't save you maybe a couple of them have a, have a bunker but most of them are behind two locks at best that's the point here it's that if we don't learn to work together if we don't learn to empathize across cultural divides and class divides we're gonna all devolve into a chaotic uh, a reality and the chaos is rising we can already see it we can see the poverty rising we can see the wealth that's transferring to the upper class and again i said you have to empathize with the billionaires but at the same time the billionaires have to realize what they're doing they have to realize that they have to understand their fear. They have to understand the underlying cause of their greedy desires is their fear of that poverty. But that poverty comes when, when you are greedy, when you collect excess resources, you create more poverty. <laughs> so you're basically feeding a vicious cycle. It's, it's illogical. In the long term, it's illogical. In the short term, it might make sense. But there's no telling when the end of that short term cycle comes. There's no telling when shit's going to hit the fan. You can predict it, but again, if we look at Austrian economics, the, 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 the thing we say is that you can't predict when something's going to happen. You can just predict that something's going to happen. You can't predict when. That's, that's, learn a little bit from that. Learn a little wisdom from those Austrian econ economists. Okay, We don't know when shit's going to hit the fan. And if you keep being greedy to insulate yourself from poverty, you're going to create more poverty and the poverty is going to come for your ass. It's going to come knocking on your door. So I, I go over this cycle a lot. Again, greed is caused by fear of poverty, okay? But if we justify greedy behaviors to insulate ourselves from our fear of poverty, we create more poverty and we create more fear. It's a vicious cycle. It doesn't solve itself. It makes itself worse. That's the nature of a vicious cycle. So again, I hope you understood my explanation of inflation in this video because it's it's a it's very apparent that you do if we continue to to listen to people who who are puppeteering us whether those people are sinister or just fearful people who are justifying their greed and happen to be born into a position to exercise that greed it doesn't matter what matters is that we learn to work together
Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna link one of those clips of some. I think it's might be a CNN or MSNBC clip talking to some multimillionaire, and they're, and they're criticizing him for his lack of an argument. And it's a, it's a good clip. It's basically a millionaire who's pointing the finger at some you know distraction instead of realizing that the fraud is actually the cause of the economic instability. So uh, just hopefully you watch that clip. Just give that a little thought. Thanks for watching.